In November 2018, a 34-year-old Chinese researcher named He Zhangqui made a startling announcement to the world via YouTube. Two beautiful little Chinese girls named Lulu and Lala came crying into the world as healthy as any other babies. Working in secret, He had taken the power of heredity into his own hands. For the first time, he had intentionally altered a gene in the embryos of twin girls, an alteration that would be passed on to their children and their children's children down through the generations. Changing the genetic code of the human race. For generations. For generations. The announcement triggered immediate condemnation. I personally don't think that it was medically necessary. Why is it so much secrecy? Her's work, Secrets. critics said, was arrogant, premature, irresponsible, even monstrous. This is a red line. Why you choose to cross this line? Crossing a scientific Rubicon before the ethics or the technology had been fully considered. In the United States, this kind of action would have been, frankly, illegal. I feel deeply disturbed. It's inappropriate and something that we had been working hard to avoid. But behind the outcry was a recognition. This moment heralded the arrival of a new era, an era in which humans are no longer at the mercy of their genes, but can control and even change them. It is a scientific revolution of almost unlimited promise and peril. Genes contain a history of ourselves, uh, our ancestry, and by definition, they contain our future because we will pass them along for generations. The challenge with all these technologies is that DNA is not just a genetic code, it is in some sense also a moral code. It doesn't just ask questions about what we will become. Now that we have these tools, we have the capacity to ask the question, what can we become? Now that I can change DNA and thereby change our future, what will I do? Welcome to NET's Genetic Medicine and You. Today we'll focus on some of the latest developments of genetics and personalized medicine, as was seen in the recent documentary, The Gene and Intimate History. In fact, you just saw a clip from the beginning of that documentary. We're gonna see more clips throughout the program today and discuss some of the medical breakthroughs that have been happening. I'm pleased to welcome our panelists today, First, uh, Robin Bowman, who is the Professional Development Associate at the Personal Genetics Education Project at Harvard Medical School. Chris Durance, who's the director of the documentary, The Gene and Intimate History. And Dr. Lois Starr, who's a clinical geneticist and associate professor of pediatrics at the Monroe Meyer Institute of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I'm Maurice Godfrey, a professor at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in the Monroe Meyer Institute, and I thank you all for joining us today. And we've already had some questions from the audience, so please keep sending your, your questions through the chat in uh, YouTube or, or Facebook, and we'll try our best to, to answer all of your questions. At the end, we also would like you to fill out the survey that's in the Facebook chat. It links to the Nebraska, uh, netnebraska.org slash genetics webpage. And if you fill out the, uh, the survey, you will be entered to win a kit from 23andMe or a DVD copy of the film, The Gene and Intimate History. So I'd like to go to our panelists first. Chris, tell us how this film came about and why it was so important to begin this story now. Thanks, Maurice, and good evening, everyone. So wonderful to be with you. Um, why, why this film? Why now? We've had a, on cancer, really, there have been two huge developments in the field of genetic science that, that really called out for, it seemed to us, uh, greater public awareness and greater public debate. 
And the first is the ability to read genomes, to read genomes, to read the sequences that make up us as humans and, and frankly, every living being, and to read them in a, in a, in a speed and at a cost that really makes it access, accessible to pretty much everyone. I'm sure we'll hear from Lois later about how that's revolutionizing medicine. And then the second, and perhaps more, even more pertinent, is our ability to edit, our ability to, to change genes. And, and if we think of a simple word processor, uh, what we can do now is not just read the letters on a screen that make us uh, make up every living being, the A, C's, T's, and G's, but also start to edit them and edit them again in ways that are cheap and relatively reliable at the moment. And that technology will improve to, to, to make it safer and more reliable. And what that does is, is mean that we really are the first generation in history, in the history of our planet, our universe, that's had those powers. And those powers are enormously consequential. We can literally change our future, the future of the human race. Uh, we can control nature. And up to now, it's really only been evolution that's been able to do that. And so it felt that, that bringing home to people the, the technologies, the simplicity of the technologies, taking people on that scientific journey, the journey, the, the journey that's hugely exciting, but also, as Sid says in that clip at the, at the opening of the film, potentially hugely perilous as well, uh, felt like a public service really almost beyond any other. And so we were thrilled to have a chance to collaborate with him, to collaborate with Ken Burns and, and bring, this, bring this to life. Thanks. Uh, Robin, you're at uh, the Personal Genetics Education Project, PG Ed, and you have a great deal of work that you do for education and education related areas. And so how did you bring parts of this film uh, of the gene to the public in an educational environment. Yeah, thanks, Maurice. Um, yeah, so the Personal Genetics Education Project is, is based out of the Department of Genetics at Harvard Medical School. And uh, we were contacted by WETA, who produced this film, um, originally to just be a part of their public engagement um, group that was going to advise them on public engagement. And during that meeting, we, you know, I learned about the um, educational outreach component of, of PBS and the work that they do. And when I saw this film and the subjects that it was talking about and stuff, I was like, these are the exact same topics that, that PG Ed talks about every day. And a lot of what we do is like writing curriculum um, for teachers to use in, in classrooms. Uh, all of our stuff is freely available. Um, so it just turned out to be a really great partnership between PG Ed and WETA in terms of creating the educational content to um, kind of work as a companion piece to the film so that teachers can show clips from the film and then kind of expand on that with lessons that, that have their students dig in a little bit deeper and, and really get into, you know, thinking about not just what the technology is, but what the implications of that technology may be. Great, thank you. Lois, you are at the, the cutting edge of actually seeing the fruits of what can happen at the, at the clinical level. So someone like me who spent years in a laboratory uh, tinkering with test tubes is very different than you are with, with people and their desires to improve health and, and, and their genes. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really eager to be a part of this. I absolutely love the book, love the film, and um, it's really great to be a part of this. Uh, yeah, so on a daily basis, that's what I do for the most part is see patients. Um, there is a small research role that I play, but as a geneticist mostly, I'm seeing a lot of newborns, but also children of all ages and adults and trying to sort out what genetic changes they might have that help, would help us improve their medical care. So it's never about labels. It's always about helping for their medical journey to make things make sense and to understand their families and to take the best care of them that we possibly can. 
And I would say over this past year or two, we have been giving out more reliable diagnoses than I've seen in my career up until then combined. So it's a really exciting time. Well, the, the, the promise of the Human Genome Project was not just to map the blueprint of our DNA, but to actually learn from it so we can improve things, especially when it comes to genetic disease. So our, our next clip that we'll go to features the, the latest uh, winners of the, the Chemistry Nobel Prize, uh, Emmanuel uh, Charpentier and Jennifer Dunda, uh, Dudna, I'm sorry, who talk about their uh, discovery of CRISPR technology. And we've actually had a couple of questions from the audience on CRISPR. So we'll watch the clip and then we'll get to some of the questions. So please um, send in your questions. In 1987, a researcher discovered that some bacteria incorporate short pieces of viral DNA into their own. The University of California's Jennifer Doudna was one of the scientists who wondered why. I love mysteries, and I love puzzles. I mean, I think that's why I became a scientist. I, I love the idea that I spend my life trying to figure things out. And the mystery here was a lot of bacteria store pieces of viral DNA in their chromosome, in their own DNA. They grab these little bits of viral DNA, insert it into the genetic material of themselves, and then keep it for future use. So why? Doudna and others determined that the bacteria are actually using the viral DNA to recognize future attacks. The system is known by its acronym, CRISPR. I kind of liken CRISPRs to biometric identification systems where you might store fingerprints or retinal scans as a way to be able to recognize specific individuals in the future. Bacteria are doing the same thing, but they're storing little snippets of DNA from viruses in their own genetic material. But bacteria don't just identify their viral attackers by those snippets of DNA. They also devised a way of destroying them. At a conference in Puerto Rico, Doudna and a French colleague, Emmanuel Charpentier, agreed to collaborate. And together, they eventually figured out how bacteria do it. CRISPR can be regarded as a programmable molecular scissors so scissors uh, that will be programmed to recognize a certain specific sequence on the genomes of virtually any cell and organism will be able to cut uh, this DNA at a very specific place. The CRISPR systems in bacteria are really a seek and destroy kind of system. They have molecules whose job is to detect that foreign DNA and recognize it as, as a virus. And then in the second step, CRISPR molecules cut it up. It was then that Doudna and Charpentier made a conceptual leap that would change the history of science. Would it be possible, they wondered, to extract CRISPR from bacteria and take control of its guidance system? In other words, could they re-engineer CRISPR into a simple tool for editing any kind of DNA at any spot they chose? After years of tinkering, they got their idea to work. So effectively, they realized this little molecular machine, they could program it with any DNA. And basically, that's why it's so amazing. If you know a DNA sequence in an organism, you can change that gene. CRISPR is biology's super Swiss army knife. It seems to be able to do just about everything, and it can do it faster, cheaper, more accurately, more easily than anything that came before it. Well, th thank you. I hope you all enjoyed the, uh, the, the, the clip that uh, NET just played, and it's about CRISPR. So we've had a couple of related questions from Nina and Lisa on, on Facebook that ask about the use of CRISPR for newborn screening and genome editing in vivo. 
Uh, Lois, I'm going to go to you with, uh, with that question. Sure. Yeah. So CRISPR is a term that I hear not infrequently in the clinic. It's something where, you know, parents uh, very well intended are wondering how do you know, now that you've given us this diagnosis, the answers are wonderful, but what do we do to fix it? And so CRISPR comes up, you know, often in those discussions and what is, what does CRISPR even stand, stand for? And, um, it's tough for all of us to remember this acronym, but it's clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. And it's basically a way of describing um, a bacterial function where it can um, intertwine a viral DNA so that it can then recognize that viral DNA and uh, sort of seek it out and attack it. Well, it's a way that we can pre-program RNAs to locate a spot where we could cut the DNA. So I love that it came up as a question with newborn screening because wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to seek out and destroy some of these areas that could cause problems right at the beginning, right, right when babies are born? Well, um, newborn screening, most of you are probably familiar with newborn screening at some level and the principles of that, but we do newborn screening um, at about 24 hours of life to try to detect conditions that have a few basic principles. So things that um, very serious conditions and things that there's a real treatment for that if we can intervene right now, we have a good chance to protect this patient from um, suffering that otherwise they wouldn't have to have. So, you know, what could be better then, um, you know, think about this technology in that same way. It really makes a lot of sense. So a lot of respect to those of you who are asking those questions. Um, really, when a child is born, though, would be at a point where CRISPR may not be ideal. So we heard in that first clip about um, the Chinese researcher that intervened at the very first stages of the embryo. And that would really be um, at almost the latest stage that we could do this in some ways for something that's in the germline, something that's in every cell. Um, however, what's, what I think is really exciting is that they're talking about ways of intervening with cells that make sperm cells, that make eggs. And so it's it's less of an intervention after the fact, but would be something that perhaps could prevent some of our most devastating illnesses before those um, germline cells are even in the mix, you know, from a much earlier stage. And so that is really exciting. From a newborn perspective, though, in genetic medicine, it's only a matter of years. In fact, I'm kind of surprised we're not there yet because we would certainly be capable of the blood spots that are taken from newborn babies at 24 hours of age and testing for the vast majority of the conditions that we test for now with newborn screening. With more chemical-based studies, we do some genetics on that newborn screen, but there's certainly a lot more. But then of course the question is, is what do you want to know? And being responsible with, maybe we don't want to know everything. Maybe we want to be really careful um, and responsible with what genetic information we know really at any age. Lo Lois, there's a follow-up uh, that Nina asked about the, the newborn screening. And does that, does that prevent a, a, what she terms a diagnostic odyssey later on? Oh, absolutely. And that the term diagnostic odyssey is, it couldn't be more true. We, it, it can be years of, we tried this test, now let's move on to this one. Um, personally, I, I just, my heart wrenches for some of the things that my families have gone through trying to find answers and genetic testing is always improving and it's always becoming more affordable. And so usually when we follow up, there is something else that I can offer to them. And absolutely, if we did more thorough testing um, for newborns, it would cut down on that potential diagnostic odyssey down the road, sure thing. And, and it already does, you know, for example, we've been doing, um, 
uh, screening for sickle cell and cystic fibrosis and, and conditions that a lot of people are very familiar with that used to some take, take, sometimes take many years to figure out that children had. Um, so the newborn screen is definitely the, the place to have um, a huge impact for early diagnostics. Robin, there are a couple of questions uh, from Kelsey and, and Mandy on, on Facebook that talk about or ask about uh, the direct-to-consumer testing, their downsides, are they worth the expense, and the differences between uh, something that would be direct-to-consumer versus, I suppose, going to a genetic center to do whole genome uh, sequencing. So do, should the average person be involved here? Well, there's a whole wide range of direct-to-consumer products that are available to a person right now. Um, and you kind of have to read the fine print to know exactly what it is that you're getting. Um, are you going to just be getting information that's useful to track your ancestry? Are you getting information that's related to um, health? Or, you know, just there are other types of testing that just tell you sort of interesting but not very consequential information like whether or not you're likely to like the taste of cilantro or you know have attached or detached your lobes right um so you know there, there's a wide range of reasons why a person may or may not want to want to get that information um you know for some people they they get genetic information and it helps them fill in some blanks it helps them to understand you know, their health better, it helps them to understand their ancestry better. But for other people, they may get results that are unexpected, perhaps in a good way, or perhaps in a, a not so great way, you know, that can make them either call into question, you know, their sense of personal identity, or, um, you know, as you said, you can learn health information that may be unsettling, especially if you find out some information that you're predisposed to a disease for which there may not be, you know, a, a treatment or cure. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't advise people to do genetic testing or not to, but, you know, just do your research ahead of time and, and make sure that you know what you're, what you're getting in for and that you, you want the information that, that the package you're buying would give you. Lois, there's a, another question here, a question from, from John on, on Facebook, and it almost reminds me of the film Gattaca, where someone has all of their genetic information and it, it lets everyone know ahead of time what's going to happen, which we know that if you have seen the film, it's not quite true. Uh, so a asking, when will there be a time when we carry our, our genome in our pocket and go to, the, to our physician with our known genome to help uh, diagnosis and treatment? Yeah, I don't think we're very far. I think that right now, a lot of the testing that I can get my hands on for patients is driven by the payers and insurance companies. And right now, a lot of that is, you know, advocating for the patients, trying to get that testing covered. And I predict it won't be five to 10 years at the most before that's flipped around on us. And the insurance companies are saying, well, this is completely irresponsible to treat them without genetic testing. You need to do this test, you know, before we're going to cover it. How are you doing tailored medicine without knowing their full genome and their risk for clotting or for different meds or what the condition even is, et cetera. So I don't think it will be very long. It might be Will it be in your pocket? Will it be with a retina scan? Will it, I, I'm not sure, but I can assure us for better or for worse, because again, I really want to advocate for responsible genetics. Um, it's coming. And um, this is why, you know, you guys and Chris's film and everything coming together to better educate the public about these issues is so timely because it is coming and um, we better be prepared to, to deal with it. So I think very smart question, definitely on its way. If I could echo Robin's answer to the direct to consumer testing also, I, I just wanna throw in there, um, direct to consumer testing, if it motivates you to make some smart lifestyle choices, et cetera, I'm okay with that. What worries me the most is understanding what it didn't test for. You know, thinking that I have a family history of a breast over or ovarian cancer. I did this study. I'm in the clear, but
but not understanding that it's not as thorough of clinical testing as we can provide um, on a clinical basis. And yeah, Chris, so Chris I, I, information can be more dangerous, right? <laughs> than, than a lot. Maurice, before we move on, can I can I hop in and, and make oh, a comment too about sure. CRISPR? Just I I spend my days being devil's advocate a lot of times. And I just want to make sure that we kind of talk about um, not just like the excitement that CRISPR brings in terms of the potential to um, you know maybe eradicate some diseases that we to this point haven't even had any good treatments for, let alone cures. Um, but, you know, the reason I have a job, the reason we go out there and, and talk to people about these things is that not everyone agrees whether or not CRISPR is a, a good thing, right? It's kind of like talking about whether or not a hammer is a good thing, right? A hammer can be used to, to build a house or it can be used to like whack somebody over the head, right? And so CRISPR is the same way. It's, it's not inherently good or bad. And it's all about how we decide that we're going to use it. Um, you know, when we talk about germline editing, where we could, um, potentially make edits to the sperm or eggs, right? And those, those edits could get passed on for generations. You know, on one hand, the argument could be, you know, not only might we be on the cusp of curing something like sickle cell disease, but if we edit the germline cells, then we're getting rid of sickle cell disease, you know, for the rest of the generations of that person, right? Um, but on the other hand, um, when we're making those edits, if there happen to be any they call off target effects, right? Some either mistakes or some changes that happen that weren't necessarily what we were trying to do. Those also get passed on throughout the generations, you know? So this is, this is why, you know, a lot of research has to go into this. A lot of studies have to be done and we really have to proceed with caution because on one hand, there's a ton of excitement, but on the other hand, you know, you, you can make big mistakes too. I just add, and I, sorry, Maurice. I just no, add. No, one, go ahead. Just add one thing there. I mean, you know, we have twenty thousand or so genes, and the idea that we know what each one does and how they interact, and how the proteins that they produce interact, and how they work with all the other things that go on inside the trillions of cells in our body, I mean, is is hubristic beyond belief so even the even the sense that, that, a, that a gene associated with a with a common disease like sickle cell or with with a, with a certain cancer that we understand what else that gene does and what changing that gene a gene that's evolved with us and with our surroundings over hundreds of thousands of years is you know is it, we really have to proceed with caution as, as Robin and Lois have both have both emphasized and yet we have this this, this hammer, this Swiss army knife, this incredibly cheap. I mean, I can't emphasize how cheap and how powerful this tool is. It is ubiquitous in science labs. And the temptation to use it must be so great. And, and yet we, we need to proceed with caution, with knowledge, uh, um, with humility. That's absolutely right. And, and in fact, if one goes back to the history, the, it was the, the early molecular biologist geneticists who always proceeded with caution. The, the, if you go back to some of the things in the, in the late 70s uh, and early 80s, the caution was the, was the key. And, and now you're seeing some lack of caution in, in some places can, that can be frightening. Chris, I'm just wondering before we get to the next clip, when you were when you're making the film, how did you uh, space the different parts? I mean, did you go by the chapter by chapter from from the book, or or how did you put things together so there is that kind of flow? Uh, I mean, we saw the opening, which sets things up in a very powerful way and scary potentially. That's a that's a great question, and it's we we took about three years to make the film. Um, I wasn't the only director. My wonderful colleague, Jack Youngelson, and uh, our senior producer, Barrett Goodman, Ken Burns, advising us, stood at our shoulders whenever we had, whenever we had scientific questions in particular. We're all there to, to guide the project and many other people as well. Um, I think for us, what was, what was paramount was trying to find ways of bringing these stories to life, bringing this science to life. And... So our earliest and most uh, useful conversations were actually with a whole host of people on the front lines, people like Lois uh, this evening, people who deal 
with patients who deal with the real world consequences of the genetic revolution. Um, because we are in the midst of a revolution. You heard Lois earlier talk about how just in a year or two, it's transforming her clinic. And that's going on across science in, in the food business, in, in pediatric medicine, in scientific research. The changes are just coming thick and fast and, and CRISPR is accelerating that even more. And so staying on, st trying, to, trying to be relevant and trying to keep it interesting was was a challenge. But I think what we, what we eventually hit on was uh, a series of stories of, of, of people, um, of scientists, of patients, of families who were, who were living genetics, living the quandaries, living the questions that our audience is asking, living the quandaries that, that Lois faces. So we, we, we met a, a father and, and his young daughter, Susanna, who were going on the type of genetic odyssey that one of our questioners was asking about. Um, and at the end of that, like increasing numbers of people, they got an answer, an, uh, a, an indecipherable, in, indecipherable gene called KIF1A, KIF1A, about which very, very little was known. And we were able to follow them over a, a couple of years as that first piece of information became, um, became an approach, not an answer, not a, a cure, not even really a treatment yet, but gave them a path forward, gave them, gave them some clarity where there had been none and, and a way forward. And so it was, a, it was a collection of those stories that I think really helps our audience um, get a handle on what is going on around them. And the other thing we wanted to do was not make it just a scientific story. Uh, we've, talked, uh, we've talked already about the perils of, of CRISPR. And one thing's apparent from, from the history of science, the history of genetic science, is that there is this almost parallel journey of, of, of light and dark, perhaps. The eugenics movement um, from the the late 19th century, early 20th century, was all built on, on, on progress that those scientists thought before they knew really what genes were and what, what DNA was, but the sense that they did know, the sense that they understood inheritance. And it led, obviously, to the, the, the terrible atrocities in, in, Nazi, in Nazi Germany. So throughout, there's been this, this tension between scientific progress and, and hubris or overreach. And, and that was also something that we wanted to, to thread through the the story so I, I hope people watch it and i hope and i think what they'll find is is is, is science brought to life is science brought home um, for them in in a, in a fascinating and compelling way Th thanks chris i i completely agree when i spent years in the laboratory it was very important for me to know that what we were dealing with were not just bits of dna and bits of tissue but these were people and their stories and 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 lois uh, speaks to that really well. So we're not going to tr transition. The NET crew will put up the next clip and we show Dr. Uh, Wendy Chung and her interactions uh, with, with patients with rare diseases. And then we'll come back to some more uh, dis uh, questions from the audience. So please keep sending your questions. She, and she is a Susanna's doctor. Uh, so the, the girl that, that I mentioned yes. earlier. Okay, perfect. Dr. Wendy Chung is a gene hunter. From her lab at Columbia University Medical Center, she runs major research projects on heart disease, cancer, and autism. But her passion is the universe of more than 5,000 rare diseases.
Chung is trying to harness a revolution in genetics to find and perhaps block the genes that cause rare disease. So we'll go ahead and get started. We're going to have a few cases that we're talking about this morning. When I grew up in medical school as a resident, we knew about these conditions and we just had nothing to offer. And it's very, very different now. This is a brand new era in terms of genomic medicine. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. OK, come on around. Let's have a seat. Chung works closely with families of children she treats to raise awareness of rare diseases. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. Um, we're going to use the time to give some updates, and so I thought we'd just start with updates in terms of how everyone's doing. Um, because their children's diseases are so uncommon, they have been largely ignored by drug companies and the government. They must rely on each other and on a few interested scientists like Dr. Chung. One of the things that I think you're aware of, but just to be put out there, is that at least for three of you, you have undertaken the Herculean task of putting on family meetings this summer. Luke, do you want to share? Sure. So we're having a conference in August. I hope you all can come, because that's really important to me, too, is having... Luke Rosen and Sally Jackson have a four-year-old daughter, Susanna, who has a rare degenerative condition that affects her motor skills and cognition. It was a normal pregnancy and, you know, normal delivery. She was born at 39 weeks. And the pediatrician came in and said, she's perfect. She came home and she was cranky. She was cranky. She cried a lot. She made her milestones, but just barely. And then when she was crawling, she, she was just pulling her legs behind her. So it wasn't even a real crawl. And then one day, I had her in the bathtub and she was sitting in her bath chair. And I said, come on, Shasha, kick, kick, kick. And she didn't. Later, when I would say again in the bath, kick, 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 she would reach down and lift up one of her legs. As their concerns grew, the Rosens sought help. Susanna underwent test after test, but no one could figure out what was wrong. Okay, fine, just this one MRI, this one half hour EEG, they're not gonna find anything, please. And I wanna do it, of course, because I wanna get the all clear. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm still getting over that there wasn't an all clear. Finally, a test revealed that Susanna had an anomaly in a gene known to be involved in muscle control. Her father, Luke, sought the advice of a neurologist. I sat down at her desk, and she said, tell me what it is again. And I said, KIF1A gene. I could tell she had to tell me something that was horrible. She printed something out and handed me this piece of literature. And then she said, we don't know enough about it. We don't know what it is. I think she said those horrible words, which were to enjoy every day that you have with her. That is a condolence card. I don't want a sympathy note. I want, I want some, some answers. I want some information. And then someone said, you really should see Wendy Chung. I actually remember very distinctly the day I was down at a genetics meeting in Alabama, and I got this urgent call, and uh, literally, as soon as we got a coffee break, I got on the phone with Luke and Sally, and I could tell they were in a state of confusion and panic uh, because they weren't sure exactly what this meant. KIF-1A is the gene, what we call a molecular motor. To be able to move your body the way you want to, you have to get signals from your brain to your muscles. It's like the railroad, and KIF-1A is the locomotive that's moving things along the railroad. These signals are transported along nerve cells, and proteins made by the KIF-1A gene keep those nerve cells healthy. But when the gene is corrupted, the signals can't get through and the nerve cells die. That is what is happening to Susanna.
All right. We're back, and thank you so much for all these wonderful questions. We hope we can get to, uh, to all of them. The first one is very interesting, and uh, Mary on Facebook is asking about the effects that, that genetic testing uh, has on in our insurance. And so if you have no symptoms, you don't have a diagnosis, but you have genetic information, what does that do? So Lois, since you're in the clinic with patients, I'll go with you, to you with this. Yeah, so um, to my surprise, we, or, or at least it doesn't come back to us, a lot of negative stories with, you know, now that I have this diagnosis, it changed things with my current insurance company. Um, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of, I believe, 2007, 2008, yeah. uh, made it illegal to discriminate on the basis of health insurance. Of course, I think that we would all have hesitation with, you know, fine, it's illegal, but is there some roundabout way of discrimination? It's it, especially with, you know, keeping your job. That is now where our insurance comes from, for the most part, things like that. Um, but life and disability insurance, it is legal. And it makes sense, frankly. I mean, insurance is something where if everybody knows what, you know, if you knew what you were predisposed to, it wouldn't be in the sense that same type of, of insurance, because of course you would insure differently if you had knowledge and insurance is based on everyone being at that unknown risk. And so um, I think we all understand that. But the good news is, is at a clinical level, and I'm sure there's a lot of folks who have personal experiences where perhaps it has been a problem, but um, most, most, and of course, most people coming to me, of course, they are probably still insured, but uh, we don't hear as many negative stories as I might have anticipated would happen. We always, you know, let people know that, that you know, once we have this testing, it will confirm whether or not you're at risk to have this condition. Um, a lot of people are worried about pre-symptomatic conditions, where if they're pre-symptomatic, but it is a later onset uh, type of condition, like Huntington is one of those just really, really complicated, really difficult conditions that um, if you're if you're not symptomatic, do you get tested for that or not? And even once you come to grips with that from a psychology perspective, then you have to worry about too, what does this do to my financial livelihood? It's really unfair um, things to put on someone. So really good questions. And again, to my knowledge, it can impact your disability and life insurance. So get those things in order um, as good as you can before you would get testing like this. But from a health insurance perspective, um, some people might be just interested in what I taught you. Know, my, my patients who have rare disease, I always encourage them to work as, you know, work as hard as you can in school. Chris's film highlights someone very well who's doing amazing um, with a complicated neurologic disorder. And so, you know, I encourage them every time, work as hard as you can in school so that some big company wants to pick you up and take care of all that medical for you and, and you're protected from that perspective as well, um, especially patients with cystic fibrosis, sickle cell, things like that. But the good news is, is they are protected from discrimination for their health insurance. Chris, as you, as you are making the film, you have extraordinary uh, science stories in there. You have, uh, as we just saw in, in the clip, uh, uh, amazing personal stories and, and the one that, that Lois just uh, alluded to as well. But when did, did the business side of medicine and genetics come up in, uh, in your discussions? A little bit, uh, and it's come up in both of the the scientific films we've made. Actually, in the case in in the cancer film, uh, drug pricing, the cost of, of of the drugs that many of these specialist treatments, um, the specialist genetic advances in cancer were producing these hugely hugely expensive drugs, and in the case of genetics, um, similar issues. More about access and and. Equality. It was, there's, there's a sense that in, in, that that not all research has been has been directed evenly across um, 
across all sectors and, and to the benefit of all sectors of society. And there's a fear, I think, of a fairly widespread fear that not all treatments are going to be accessible. And so the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, actually has a big program to try and ensure that not only is our understanding of genetics based on uh, diverse populations, not just white, U- white populations of European ancestry, uh, but also that treatments that are emerging increasingly rapidly um, and other insights are accessible broadly as well. And, and the story of sickle cell is, 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 a pretty, is, is a pretty telling one. I mean, it, it was one of the first genetic breakthroughs in terms of, in terms of disease. And, and yet, for whatever reason, the research uh, didn't seem to, to produce the kind of medical results that one would, that one would have thought that one would have thought feasible in a, in a reasonable time frame, and I think there was a fair amount of suspicion in certain communities that um, that this was a product of business choices. This was a product of medical choices that were just that were, were not taking account of uh, a fully representative populations. And we'll we'll get to uh, to sickle cell in our in our next clip. But first, we have a couple of questions. Uh, related one from uh, Janet, one from Diana, about cancer and cancer genetics related to BRCA1, for example, or new discoveries for pancreatic cancer. Is that, uh, Lois, do you, do you have some uh, insight into these uh, p- potential advances here? Um, I guess I, I'm not quite sure which ones that they're getting at. BRCA1 and 2. Um, Maurice, you educated me today too, because I thought that BRCA meant breast cancer was an abbreviation for that, but um, he enlightened us that it actually stands for Berkeley, California, where the discoverer uh, found the genes. And so um, mostly for the wider audience, I guess I'm probably disappointing who asked the question, but for the wider audience, I would say, you know, these are genes that are well known to they're tumor suppressors. And so when you have a change in the gene that disrupts how it would go on to um, translate into a protein, you're going to have more hiccups in how you would prevent cancer. So they do not predict cancer a hundred percent, you know, knowing that you have one of these changes in a gene does increase the likelihood that you may develop breast and ovarian mainly, but BRCA2, for example, can highly, um, make males susceptible to prostate cancer and uh, pancreatic cancer is also in the mix as well as many other cancers. So what I would say is for those who maybe were tested for BRCA1 and 2 and the primary uh, variations that were thought to cause the highest predisposition to to cancer, to revisit um, your genetics folks or your oncologist because we know now that there's many other variations in that gene and we would always also offer p53 as well as you know there's several other genes depending on what the familial family history is um, to consider it's much broader now than it even was just a few years ago so to consider updating your testing um, i think the treatment based on your position with those primary genes is rapidly improving, but as as far as like specific treatments or using CRISPR, for example, um, I'm not aware of any big changes here recently. There's a a specific question of staying with you, uh, Lois, about Cowden's syndrome and the P10 test. This is from uh, Callie on Facebook, and and I'm certainly, I'm not familiar with that, so I'm, I'm sure you are. Oh, I've got a really big soft spot for P10 and Cowden syndrome. I have a few lovely families who have this condition and a few patients who um, have really struggled with this. Uh, It's a really interesting condition in that while it does have a cancer predisposition, um, and there's different cancer. We have to screen them very young for even colon cancer and things like that with scopes, et cetera. Thyroid cancer is really big with 
with P10 associated um, conditions. But um, I am also really passionate about the autism um, diagnosis and, and enlightening answers, you know, from that perspective for families. And P10 uh, is can also affect neurodevelopment. And so when there is changes in the P10 gene, often they can have macrocephaly or a larger head size and um, autistiform behaviors. And so it gives us a clue to do P10 as well as other genetic testing that they're entitled to, but P10 in particular. Um, it's one of the things I can use for medical necessity. If I have a patient who has a larger head, some autistiform behaviors, um, you know, we should want to know whether or not they have P10 among other things, but uh, P10 in particular, because we would treat them differently. You know, screening uh, from a financial perspective for the insurers, catching one thyroid cancer very early, it, you know, saves them hundreds of thousands of dollars in treatment potentially. So this is one of our avenues to be able to get that testing for families that need it is to, um, is, is to really bring up the, the positives, not only for patient outcomes, that's our number one goal, of course, but for using those resources in a smart way as well. So yeah, P10 is really important. This, we put a lot of smart question, questioners today. Um, I wonder if this, if this person knows that with P10 in particular, you have to be really careful with that sequencing because of the pseudogene involvement. And so yes, sometimes the labs do have to take a special look at that and make sure that they aren't sequencing it just like any other gene. They have to do some extra tricks to make sure they do it appropriately. Being somewhat sensitive to uh, patient confidentiality, I'm not going to name this person, but someone on Facebook is asking about Leiden Factor 5 that has been found in the family, but this individual is, has been negative. However, they've developed blood clots and bilateral pulmonary embolisms. So are there other uh, genetic blood disorders that, that can be associated with? Yeah, absolutely. They need to have screening um, with a thrombophilia panel, which they probably had if they had if they had their factor five testing after they were aware of the blood clots. If they did it just for familial risk, perhaps not. Um, but certainly the physician seeing them for blood clotting would do a thrombophilia panel. That would catch most of the things that we know to look for at this point um, from a genetic perspective that would be reliable. There's a lot of diseases out there that we still can't put together. And there's so many conditions where there is, I think Dr. Mukherjee explains these as was that a shove gene or was that a nudge gene? Is that right? And, and I, in, in academics and in medicine, um, when I'm talking to medical students and residents and fellows and families, I use um, the chancellor genes. You know, they have a say, they're gonna change the way things go. You have little, little to do with that. You can help as much as you can, but you're not gonna be able to avoid, you know, the the chancellor coming down and saying, this is what's going to happen here. Um, but there's a lot of faculty and it takes a whole lot of faculty toggled in the right direction to make a big difference in your health. And so that's kind of in reference to the direct to consumer testing that's done where they're looking at a lot of SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. It's a lot of changes. They're important changes, but they can't make huge impacts in your, you know, your medical development overall, like a, a chancellor change can. So a single gene disorder, something like the P10 we were talking about, if there's a variation in that gene that causes damage, that's a chancellor change. That is going to impact my patients significantly and what do we need to do to optimize this outcome using all the knowledge that we have from previous physicians, healthcare folks, and patients. Um, but then those faculty changes, so those things where you talk, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because you're, you might be getting a question about the MTHFR gene or the M tetrahydrofolate reductase is a very, uh, very widely searched um, condition, but it's so common in the population that if you have clotting 
And I would encourage you to look beyond MTHFR. Certainly, perhaps there's a role there, but if you have significant clotting, even pulmonary emboli, um, I would look for something uh, more dominant in that in that sense. So that that's great. We'll have some well, your the questions that have been coming in are terrific. I uh, wish we had much more time to answer all of them, but we're going to go on. NET will now play our last clip uh, on sickle cell disease, and, and Chris alluded to that earlier. Today, new gene therapy trials are underway all over the world. One of the most eagerly watched is unfolding in Boston, Massachusetts. Its target is sickle cell disease, a debilitating and sometimes fatal blood disorder. One of the first patients on the trial is 26-year-old Brunel Etienne. We know he never cries about being sick, but the day the doctor told him that um, you can't drive because of this disease, because of he had so many strokes. strokes. I remember him crying. And then I had to ask the doctor, please, can you give us a moment? Because that was, to me, that was the moment also that was so hard for me. You know, just watching my kid and then there's nothing I can do about it. Do you have anything on your mind that you want me to ask them? Um. I still feel like weird after. Like, are you gonna feel weird after? Yeah. Okay. The sickle cell mutation causes red blood cells to stretch and stiffen, so they get stuck in small blood vessels. Sickle cell disease is always the same mutation in the gene called beta globin and it results in a change in a fundamental part of hemoglobin, which is the protein inside of red cells that helps us to carry oxygen. The difference is in one letter of the code, just one letter, it becomes abnormal, it is unable to carry oxygen properly, and it results in a diffuse disease people know about heart attacks and your arteries in your heart clogging up and how painful that is. It's sort of like that, but it's all over the body. And so that causes both pain, but it also, of course, damages whatever organ that you're, you're talking about. And that leads to the long-term complications of sickle cell disease. Brunel suffered his first stroke when he was 22 months old. And like all sickle cell patients, he needs regular blood transfusions to survive. We've known about the exact molecular defect in this case well before we had the human genome sequence. This was one of the first conditions that we understood very well. Yet, not being able to really come up with a treatment. One would think so simple, yet just dastardly difficult in terms of coming up with a treatment. For years, the only lasting remedy was a bone marrow transplant, but Brunel didn't have a suitable match. Okay. Yeah. Good job. So when he first heard that the gene therapy trial might rid him of sickle cell, he leapt at the chance. I feel like it's like a, a monster okay. that's inside me that won't go away. Makes me feel weak. but now Brunel has a chance of recovery. The clinical trial, under the guidance of Dr. David Williams at Dana-Farber Hospital in Boston, is taking a novel approach. Rather than trying to treat Brunel's disease by giving him a new, healthy blood-producing gene, Williams' team is looking to cure his sickle cell outright by targeting a companion gene. Scientists found it when a genome-wide study revealed why certain people with sickle cell were actually symptom-free. The companion gene acts like a switch that can keep their fetal hemoglobin levels high and their sickle cell disease at bay. 
Until then, no one had ever connected this gene with sickle cell, but it gave Williams an idea. We reasoned if we could reverse that switch genetically, then we could allow fetal hemoglobin to come back on and we could turn down adult beta hemoglobin. And that's what we, we designed and manufactured a virus that does just that. After extracting stem cells from Brunel's blood, William's team takes them to a specialized laboratory where they are infused with billions of virus particles carrying a healthy copy of the companion gene. The virus transports that gene straight to the nucleus of Brunel's stem cells. They're the patient's own stem cells now genetically modified. We give those back to the patient. And when we do that, when the red cells are made from those stem cells, that allows the fetal hemoglobin to come back on. And a really cool thing about that is when that happens, it turns off the sickle gene too. Today, the viruses being used in Brunel's trial are safer, having gone through years of testing to ensure that Jesse Gelsinger's tragedy is not repeated. Eight weeks after the healthy gene was carried by viruses into blood cells taken from Brunel, the gene therapy treatment is thawed and brought to his bedside, ready to be infused back into his body. cells are going in through the IV and then they can find their way to the bone marrow and kind of set up shop. March 15, you will always remember that day. Okay? Just like you remember your birthday. It's a new birthday. It's a one-time treatment that doctors hope will last the rest of Brunel's life. They will monitor him intensively to see if blood cells with a new gene will proliferate and block his sickle cell disease. We don't call this a cure because it's way too early to call that. But if everything works the way we think it should work, that will be a long lasting effect. Much of the medical field is watching the trial closely. With a long history of neglect and a quarter of a million people born with sickle cell each year, a successful outcome would represent one of the biggest and most overdue breakthroughs in genetics. Well, thank you all. I hope you've in, enjoyed the clip. It was extraordinarily in, informative. So let's, using that in, in, in terms of the next question and the, the theme of that was gene therapy. So where are we now with, uh, with gene therapy? And is that something that, uh, Lois, you see in, in the clinic on a regular basis almost? Or are we still in thinking of this as, as uh, trials, clinical trials? Yeah. Oh, I can't wait. So I cannot wait until um, it's more mainstay for some of these patients. But uh, it's pretty much all still in, clini in clinical trials. So uh, the most successful are things that have been highlighted. So this, the sickle cell gene therapy that you just um, maybe learned a little bit more about is really promising. We have um, anecdotes of patients that have just never felt this way before because they've always had pain. And um, so it's really exciting. Uh, one thing I could bring up with the sickle cell gene therapy story is um, the one of the other genes that they use to actually do the gene therapy isn't with the sickle cell gene itself. It's with a gene called BCL11A is one of the mechanisms of you know, getting the fetal hemoglobin to be produced more, more actively, you know, more proliferation of those cells so that they don't have as much sickling because fetal hemoglobin doesn't allow for sickling as much. And um, just to kind of give how complicated genetics can be and how we have to be so careful, you know, BCL11A is a gene that not long ago, um, within the past couple of years, was one of the new diagnoses that I gave to one of my patients who has intellectual disability and neurodevelopment.
developmental problems. He has a mutation in that same gene. And that's how I became the most familiar with it. And um, actually, we knew we had to watch his hemoglobin just in case he didn't have a typical hemoglobin um, studies. It was probably because this gene would when it's not functioning appropriately would upregulate his fetal hemoglobin. Well, you know, I just use that example of genetics is complicated. And Robin was talking earlier about how um, sickle cell disease, you know, using that as an example of why something that we would impact in the germline right now at, in this time and space, you know, even, even now it's, protecting hundreds of thousands, millions of people in Africa against malaria. So there's, you know, there's a lot of delicacy there and these genes are not static and standing on their own. It's all in context. And so gene therapy is very exciting. Um, it wouldn't be right to stand on the sidelines and not do gene therapy and watch these people, you know, have, have these difficult conditions. And so I'm, I'm all for the advancements. I'm really excited about it, but, but it's hard too. you know, the babies with SMA and, and they do well for a while, but we're still not to a cure. And there's a lot of complicated ethics here. And, um, I think most in the community would actually be kind of pleasantly surprised, at least at what I see from the scientists, as far as trying to be as responsible as possible and careful with the patients, the community, and where those steps take us. Robin and, and Chris, Robin first, there's a question from Grace on, on Facebook that asks about regulations uh, for gene editing. editing. Uh, Lowe's just mentioned bioethics. So are there international bioethical standards uh, that, that exist, or is it... Uh, the almost the wild west in in terms of everyone going at doing this uh, gene editing on on their own i mean that's that's one of the problems that we find right is there's sort of a, a patchwork of regulations from one country to the next and so um scientists may may hop from one country to another to do their research because they're not able legally to do it in in one country but they can legally do it in another um, groups of scientists have tried to come together and come to some sort of agreement. And, and there was an agreement that there would be a moratorium or a pause on any sort of human germline editing. So this is any edits that um, would, could get passed on to future generations. So not just edits that would stay with the individual that you're doing the edits in, but they would get passed on to future generations. And kind of the international community of scientists had agreed like, okay, there's going to be a moratorium on that. We're not going to do that until Dr. Head did. Right. So there, there's not any international body of enforcement necessarily. And that, you know, that was a, a kind of a rude awakening kind of situation. And, you know, it was not just Dr. Ho that was called in, but you know, a lot of questioning about who, who knew this was going on, who knew about this research and when did they know and why didn't they, they speak up? Well, one of the questions is, well, who do you tell? Because there is no person or board in charge of this internationally, right? So. Chris, can you speak to that at all from, from your- Absolutely, your I mean, I agree with everything that, that Robin said. And one of the things that actually came out when people started looking more deeply into the origins of Dr. Her's trial on those two young girls was that he had in fact communicated with some scientists in America. And that as far as I remember, they did seem to be aware at least uh, of his plans. But the question is, as Robin said, what do you do with that information? If you're planning a trial in America, then you would go through an ethics board. Uh, you would almost certainly you would have to do it in, in probably in a, in a hospital setting or research uh, institute setting. And, uh, and those would have procedures. But for members of the public who are now living in a world where this is possible, it's, a, it's a, such a great remove from their daily lives. I'm sure for, for, for most of our audience, they would have absolutely no idea what the regulations were, who enforced them, what was possible in, in America, let alone in other parts of the world. And 
you know, Dr. Hur did his experiment. It's not quite sure what happened or why he did it. Uh, as far as I know, even today, his whereabouts are not fully understood. But I would not be surprised if someone told me that other scientists were were, were tinkering around tinkering around the edges of of these experiments, um, because there is no there is no uh, planetary control or monitoring system of it, and it is so easy uh, and cheap to do. One one last question, uh, Lois, real real quick, because we're running out of time. Should genetic testing be part of everyone's annual uh, physical exam? was a question from Judy on Facebook. Um, you know, should it be a part of everyone's? The easy answer to that is no way, because not everyone would want it. And it's, of course, under, um, you know, that individual's control, whether they would have genetic testing or not. And so, no. However, will it be offered at some point? And Probably uh, the cost of whole genome sequencing is declining very rapidly. And so um, having that available for risk factors for different issues is, is not, not out of the question at all. Now, something to bring up is that once you've had your genome sequenced, at least theoretically, that sequence should stay the same. You know, there can be changes in somatic cells or not the germline, not the embryologic, embryologic line that you were born with, but um, that baseline sequence should stay the same your whole life. So the telomeres changing, things like that, those are other studies. The sequence of the DNA itself should stay the same. However, our algorithm and technology to be able to look at that data changes daily. And so updating your genome, you might need to get a sequence once, but then maybe every year your doctor would do kind of, a, of an upload or more likely you'd probably get that sent to your email inbox. Are you ready to see the updates in your genome? And um, so that would be what I would predict. Well, I, I wish we had more time. This has been uh, an extraordinary discussion. Uh, first, I'd like to thank NET for uh, hosting uh, all of us and uh, the film, the documentary is available, The Gene and Intimate History. Thank our panelists, uh, Robin Bowman, Chris Durrance, and Dr. Lois Starr. You will learn more about the, this documentary, The Gene and Intimate History, if you go to pbs.org slash the gene. And if you enjoyed today's program, please join us again next Thursday, March 18th at 4 p.m. Central. A different, a second program is DNA Ancestry. And the, be a panel that will talk about the relationship between our personal genetics and our cultural heritage. It's going to be on a different platform. You need to register. It's free. Uh, netnebraska.org. So netnebraska.org org slash genetics. And on that website, you'll find more resources about genetics, including curricula that comes from a variety of places, including PG Ed, that Robin uh, has been wonderful at, at, at putting on there. So thank you, everyone. Please don't forget the, uh, the link for the drawing. If you would do a survey for uh, NET about how you enjoyed this program. Again, thank you all for all your questions and have a wonderful evening.